areas that I'm looking at are women who are transgressive uh, in many fields. And today we're looking at actresses and uh, activists uh, of the 19th century. <coughs> Now, uh, in uh, 1793, uh, Olympe de Gouges uh, mounted the steps to the scaffold, in fact, to the guillotine, uh, and mounted them, obviously, in, in mortal dread, but probably also with a sense of great disillusion and ideological betrayal. And indeed, with her died more or less uh, the struggle for women's rights for voting, women's rights for equality, for almost um, probably about 90 years. Now, Olympe de Gouges probably had a name like Jane Smith, but managed to sort of give herself, you know, that Olympe de Gouges has that, you know, little bit of a je ne sais quoi, and had sort of lived by her wits, and you know what I mean by that, um, uh, until she'd. Um, arrived at a reasonable status in society. As she, and I want you to remember this because we're going to be mentioning also another woman who came from a similar situation at the end of the lecture, Louise Michel. Olympe de Gouges was the daughter of a servant and probably the master of the chateau uh, and so benefited from a <coughs> small amount of education. And this drove her to become, uh, gradually move up the social ranks, became a playwright, and at the time of the revolution um, was a great advocate for the ideas of the revolution, and particularly in the field of women's rights. She also um, campaigned actively against slavery. So as an abolitionist, as someone who was used to or had the illusion that women were welcome in the public sphere, she was very, very dismayed um, at reading the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was, of course, uh, penned in 1789. She originally thought that the idea of man actually embraced women as well. Of course, she gradually found that this was false, and so in 1791 writes her own Declaration of the Rights of Women and of the Citizen. So this is a direct take on the title of the original. This is the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. All right? So in other words, she is claiming citizenship for women, um, meaning the vote. And of course, this was not to happen. Robespierre, at this time, she was a member of the sort of more conservative uh, wing of the Jacobin Party. She belonged to the Girondin Circle. And with this kind of declaration, she um, angered people such as Robespierre, who was against having the participation of women uh, in public debate at all. Even though uh, Olympe de Gouges says woman has a right to mount the scaffold, she must equally have the right to mount the rostrum. In many ways, uh, she paid the price uh, for this open declaration of women's rights. Uh, she had um, campaigned for the idea that women were rational beings uh, and were not only the same as men, but were equal to men. Uh, when she mounted the scaffold, there was an, a report on her death uh, in the newspapers which said, Olympe de Gouges, born with an exalted imagination, mistook her delirium for an inspiration of nature. She wanted to be a man of state. She took up the projects of the perfidious people who want to divide France. It seems the law has finally punished this conspirator for having forgotten the virtues that belong to her sex. So this then um, is the beginning um, of um, a movement, a uh, direct movement of back of women back into the, uh, the the private sphere, right? This idea of women not being acceptable in the public sphere, and this is something which will be sort of more and more formulated um, during the long 19th century. Now, um, where then? In, well, let's actually talk about what does happen to women. Um, with the uh, end of the revolution, of course, you have the uh, Napoleon Bonaparte who comes to power, who, of course, also is, is not interested uh, in having women participate in the public sphere. They are decorative. They are, um, he actually despises um, intelligent women, uh, famous for his um, look good and shut up sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, dictum to uh, Josephine. By the time you get the return of the, uh, the monarchy, 
um, with the rise of Catholicism, um, women move further and further back into the home. With the rise of the bourgeoisie, as many of you have heard me lecture on before, there's this idea of women um, really simply as, as mothers of the next generation and also as um, decorative objects um, who will sort of show the wealth and prestige um, of their husband. Uh, wearing the clothes, but also being extremely virtuous as well. So there's a kind of, you know, a return to very prudish um, morals. This, of course, is exacerbated with the development of science, which actually looks at the anatomy of the female brain and finds that, of course, it is um, much smaller than men's brains. And this is what everyone had always expected, but it's seen now as proof um, that women are inferior beings. So in many ways, um, by the... 18, uh, 1870s, 1880s, the situation of women was, was worse than it had been before the revolution. All right, One was supposed to be uh, pious, upright, virtuous. Um, you were the exact opposite of men. Men were strong, rational, energetic, um, not hysterical. Women were emotional, feeble, weak and hysterical. So this is not looking good for women. So um, how then um, do we have these extraordinary women who um, stand out throughout the 19th century in the fields of the theatre, um, literature and art? And I'm going to argue basically that these particular women create themselves as icons uh, in two ways. Firstly, by being extremely outrageous, by the fact that they are so <coughs> far outside the norms of society that the bourgeois women who, who you know, could possibly maybe want to ape their behaviour um, could not even contemplate of living such an extraordinary life. That's the first thing. And so they, they deliberately dwell on the outrageous aspects of their lives um, and exaggerate them into becoming sort of larger than life, almost fictional figures. And you, you'll see what I mean when we're talking in particular about Sarah Bernhardt. The second thing is that each of these women that we're going to be looking at today, particularly Maria Malibran, um, her sister, they sort of as one, then um, Sarah Bernhardt and then the uh, political activist Louise Michel, um, each exemplify a political or literary um, movement of the time. Uh, and so by, being, by in, being the incarnation of these ideals also managed to get away with the fact that they also happen to be women. Right? So they're not judged really as women, they are judged as phenomenons of society uh, and represent France on the international stage as well. These were, all of these women that we're going to speak about had international uh, reputations. So the, the first one we'll be looking at is Maria Malibran and then who was one of the great divas, in fact the first great um, diva in the opera scene in the 19th century in France and her sister uh, Pauline Viardot who um, took over from her when we had the tragic death um, of her sister at the age of 28. We then have the divine Sarah, Sarah Bernhardt, whose um, great motto is Comem, meaning, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I mean, I wish I'd thought of it myself. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to look at Louise Michel, who is the uh, great uh, political activist um, of, the, of the Commune, known as the Red Virgin. Right? So you have extremes uh, in, 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 in titles here. Now we're going to be looking at, during this time, at um, Paris in three stages. We're not going to be looking very much at Paris, but it, it is, I want you to remember Paris of um, the early restoration, 1811. This is the Paris of the boulevards when they're being created. Then you get the Paris of the Second Empire, which will be parallel to the time of Sarah Bernhardt and which will go on into the time of the Paris of the Commune in 1871 when um, the barricades are set up throughout Paris and it is on these barricades that uh, Louise Michel uh, will uh, create her reputation. And all of these are absolutely indomitable women. I find them very um, inspiring. You know, you sort of sit there eating your piece of toast in the morning thinking, you know, there could be more to life than this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, now, let's have a look at the Romantic era. Well, first of all, I just want to um, look at... Yes? Uh, 
No, 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 I'm blowing my nose. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, am I allowed? No, no, no. Yes, no, it's just that your, your arm went in front of the oh, okay. projector. Sorry, and I thought you were um, asking a question. All right, we, we have um, Paris then of the early Romantic period, 1811, and I just want to draw your attention very quickly <coughs> to the fact that women have already... Um, forsaken the very free clothing mm -hmm. under the revolution, which was no corsets, no wigs, uh, very, very simple, uh, unadorned fare, and already they're back in uh, what will be a prototype of the crinoline uh, with the corset back on. I just want to show you um, pictures of two of the queens of the restoration period, the queen, uh, the wife of Louis Philippe and the wife of Louis the Eighteenth. Um, both of them decked out to the nines, as you can see, corsets, um, petticoats, extraordinary hairdos, bows, extremely impractical. Everything that has gone away from the, what was thought to be the freedom of the revolution, the um, equality in dressing. All right, so women then have gone back into this role of, of representing virtue and, and propriety and, and the success of their husbands. But you also get these great singers on the stage. Now, Maria Malibran, I'll speak about her biography later in detail, but just very briefly, she was the daughter of um, a celebrated uh, tenor, Spanish tenor, uh, who drove all of his children incredibly hard and created uh, two prima donnas from, out of his two daughters and um, a, a singer and a, a someone who spends a lot of time working on the pedagogy of singing uh, in his son. Now Maria Malabran was um, considered to be the most <coughs> celebrated diva of her time and I want to sort of look at how come this happens? You know, she was born in what, 18, what was it, 1811, 18, 1808 how can this happen at a time when um, women's rights have been sort of clearly taken off the agenda as something which is important and women are moving back uh, into the private sphere? How do you suddenly get this one person catapulted um, onto the stage, talented or not? Um, there are several reasons behind this. The first one is that uh, in the 18... Um, uh, 1880s, um, uh, 1800s, you get the development of um, a, an artistic movement throughout Europe known as Romanticism, which develops it first in Germany with Goethe, uh, as, as you know, comes across into France. And the basic ideas behind Romanticism are that uh, rationality, you know, the age of reason, which was the 18th century, um, is past. Um, and the, under the influence of Rousseau, the importance of man is his ability to feel emotion and to express emotion. And so the most important aspects um, of a, a performer or a writer is to, um, is to have imagination, sensitivity, sens sensibility and so on. So um, this of course opens the way for um, female performers, um, women or at least or anyone who is going to be able to express great emotion and this is much, would have been much more difficult if you are a male lead. So you're going to find um, female leads beginning to be written into the operas in particular um, and even the novels of the period. Uh, what does romanticism is about sensitivity and emotion, but it also creates, it's also one of the great um, ideas behind romanticism is uh, that you have to live your life in, in moments of exaltation, uh, which you can't get just in the sort of the banal flowing of, of, of time from the time you're born to the time you're dead. You have to find these moments of exaltation and seek them out and of course through love and passion you're supposed to be able to do this. So one of the great themes of romanticism is unrequited love and of course here this is going to be the great role of the tragic heroines. You know, you think of Desdemona uh, in Othello, uh, Romeo and Juliet and all of these people who will become, you know, the great uh, central acts um, of the 19th century operas. So um, as um, 
a, a heroine, a romantic heroine who is doomed, you know, who, who is never going to be able to fulfill her love, you know, who, and is in, uh, eternally desirable because she has removed herself from the, the sphere of normal uh, time, the normal time frame. Right, she disappears into death or into madness or in, into a convent, but the main thing is that she disappears because, I mean, you, you can't actually su sustain being a sort of a diva 24 hours a day, can we? We all know that, don't we, girls? All right. So, um, in other words, what, what I'm saying is that the time was right uh, in terms of uh, literature uh, and music um, to have um, a woman who was the incarnation of the romantic heroine and this extraordinary expressivity which, which she had. Right? Now, the other thing which was um, of great importance at this time is that not just do you get women taking over central roles, um, but you also have the development of bel canto, mm -hmm. which is a type of singing um, which had developed in the, the um, 18th century. Um, uh, Handel, for example, is a good example. He wrote for the castrati. Now, the castrati um, were men, of course, who were cast has been castrated, but the um, important thing was that their larynx had been affected, uh, which meant that they could still sing high sounds, but they developed um, normally and in other ways developed slightly abnormally is that they seem to have gigantic rib cages. This is something that seemed to characterize Farinelli and, and the other great castrati. So they had enormous abilities to push out um, long sounds uh, and sustain <coughs> these notes. And so um, the great writers of the um, operas of the time wrote um, Da Capo <coughs> Aria, Aria's for people who had this kind of voices and capacity, and um, we'll actually see somebody, at the moment. you'll see that even the great female opera singers have enormous thoraxes, you know, you don't want to be a skinny little thing um, if you're trying to, you know, punch out sounds. Now they developed the bel canto, which was basically um, a kind of what we would call coloratura, where you have uh, sliding, you know, rapid ascension of the scales and then rapid cadenzas coming down again, roulade, you know, cooing sounds, um, trills, turns, um, sometimes leaping whole um, one or two octaves, um, sustained, incredibly sustained, smooth delivery of lines, great articulation and so on. Now, this wasn't called bel canto at the time. It became known as bel canto at the beginning of the 19th century um, when the French uh, writers of opera really uh, felt that they were being invaded by the Italians. Uh, and, of course, you do have the, all of these great writers of opera uh, who are Italians who come and work in, in Paris. Rossini, who writes his Barber of Seville, that's, you know, Cinderella, um, Othello, um, and the French didn't like it. The French actually felt that um, the uh, Italians were all about show, all about act, and there was no structure in the text, which, you know, is quite possibly correct. Um, but um, it meant that it nurtured um, people who had extraordinary voices. Now, um, Rossini, um, Barber of Seville, um, First of all, you will have Malibran's father starring in it, but also Malibran will also make um, her debut. Now, Rossini wrote of Malibran, ah, that wonderful creature. With her disconcerting musical genius, she surpassed all who sought to emulate her. And with her superior mind, her breadth of knowledge, and unimaginable fieriness of temper temperament, she outshone all other women I have known. And that's quite something um, coming from um, a man who'd worked with the other uh, divas uh, in, uh, in Italy. So the other um, writers, who the great writers of uh, opera that you had, again, were, oh, first of all, I'll talk about Racinism. Um, this is uh, Delacroix, the great artist Delacroix, who actually wrote a, made a, a uh, caricature of Rossini striding the stage at the uh, Théâtre Italien, holding up um, Manuel Garcia, who is the father of Pauline Biondo and the Malibran on one side, and two of the other divas. In other words, he's absolutely completely dominating um, the opera of the time. You also have Bellini, who writes Normal and La Sonambula, 
and of course uh, Gaetano Donizetti with Lucia di Lammermoor and um, numerous um, operas all about tragic heroines you know this is I mean you couldn't get anything more typically romantic in the romantic sense of that movement than a woman you know out in Scotland you know you know coming to a tragic end right? <laughs> even if it is Joan Sutherland and it's hard to imagine <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, there we have, um, no, just before I actually, no, this, no, just a minute, just before I start on that. Now, um, what was amazing about the La Malibran, as, as, as she will um, become to be known, was that she had an extraordinary tessitura, she, in other words, her register. She could actually sing from um, G below middle C up to um, E, and if she ex really extended herself, she could go up to F6. Which, which means basically that she could sing contralto, uh, mezzo soprano, and soprano, and she had she had this extraordinary range. Um, but evidently, it wasn't just her range which made her amazing. Um, it was the um, velvety nature of her voice, and that the Italians call it the voce in petto, this sort of um, resonance um, of of her voice. And unfortunately, there, we can only imagine what her voice must have been like because, there, of course, there are no recordings um, of her. Now, um, what has happened recently is that um, I don't know whether any of you know of Cecilia Bartoli, yes. right, um, who actually um, became very interested in these songs which were written for the castrati, but also has a similar range uh, herself. She, in the lower registers, probably nothing as good as, as, as La Maribane, but uh, she models herself very much on La Maribane and started out singing the same roles. And in fact, now she's become famous, actually developed a kind of a travelling um, museum of Maria Malibran. Um, it, it, you can actually see it on YouTube, um, if you want to, on, on, on the computer, where she actually she takes you through this kind of bus that she travels with, with all of these wonderful paintings of La Malibran. So this is real <laughs> extraordinary identity. Now I just want to give you um, an example um, of um, some of this, uh, what you call coloratura, this incredibly fussy, um, embroidered kind of singing, um, which was left open very much to inspiration. And La Malibran not only wrote many of her own pieces, but she actually improvised amazingly, like at one of the castrata when she was on stage. Now, um, oh, I was going to say something else. I'll just give you an example of it. Yes, my husband has a bit of a thing for the Chilli about all that. I can't compete on a number of fronts on the <laughs> All right, now, um, Bel Canto actually um, 
become sort of almost a, a word which is disparaged, um, particularly um, in, in France, and gradually as orchestras become bigger and more complicated, um, the single voice cannot hold out against it. So once you get the popular, well, for example, Wagner has a totally different um, style, this, this kind of uh, embroidered uh, diva type singing um, is, is not something which gives a sort of spiritual meaning that, of course, Wagner would want. But there's been um, a great revival in interest in bel canto. But anyhow, this is the sort of singing that Madagran would have indulged in. Now, she um, started out on the stage at, at the time, of, she was born um, in, in Paris um, of this uh, Spanish family, a very interesting, driven uh, family that we'll speak about in the moment, a very beautiful young woman, it always helps, I suppose, um, and her father was singing in the Barber of Seville uh, in London when the leading lady, Judita Pasta, um, became ill and he suggested his daughter taking over. So in other words, he'd already been, he was a very, very hard taskmaster, Garcia, um, and it was known for his sort of, you know, extraordinary techniques of teaching vocal um, ability. So at the age of 17, this young girl, who was very slender at the time, also got up and captivated audiences, not just with her um, range of, of singing, but with her vivacity and her passion and her fiery nature, uh, and was virtually on the road to becoming a diva. Now, um, this is her father, um, who uh, had already started out his career in Manuel Garcia in, uh, in Spain, had gone into Italy, had been uh, introduced to bel canto, had become, and he actually was one of the leading tenors of the day, but he could also sing baritone as well, so he, he clearly, you know, had this kind of range which was most unusual. <laughs> Uh, and it was um, a star on the international stage. So once he had launched his daughter, uh, Maria, he then took his wife, who was also um, a singer, and his um, uh, son, who was a, a baritone, uh, and the four of them um, sang uh, throughout um, America and, in fact, introduced the Americans to um, uh, Italian opera and bel canto. So they, these, are, these are people who are actually very important uh, in the history of opera, but no one seems to have heard very much about them. Now, um, he had a stormy relationship with his daughter. Uh, she was a sort of diva personality, obviously, and so was he. And finally, um, to escape him, when this is one of the, the ideas that she um, married a man much older than herself, uh, uh, Monsieur Malibran, who was uh, Swiss and who was um, a banker. Uh, this, this, didn't, this didn't work very well because he went bankrupt <laughs> and so she left him. Uh, but in the meantime she um, managed to strike up um, a relationship with um, a Belgian uh, pianist, um, violinist, uh, and had an illegitimate child. So you can imagine sort of on, on the this imagine the sort of virtuous uh, bourgeois woman um, even dreaming of, of having this kind of public exposure um, secondly, being divorced um, and then having an illicit relationship and an illegitimate child. So you can see that she was way out of the conventional <laughs> ideas of the time. Now, um, Garcia um, also um, was, this is what someone wrote of him, a man of exceptional gifts and strong personality. He was a man of being governed by passions and impulses, exuberant, overflowing with life and energy, a man who did everything on a grand scale. He was intelligent without being subtle, <laughs> extremely <laughs> handsome and well-built, full of charm, which was coupled with more than a dash of vulgarity. He had an extremely fine tenor voice and outstanding musical gifts. His success probably owed as much to his personality as to his voice. And I think that um, is, is the key to it, the sort of fiery, sort of um, charismatic personality, um, which one needed to couple with an exceptional voice um, to be an international star. Now, Maria went on from um, this success in New York and came back, this is her brother, um, who actually lived to be a hundred, uh, is painted by Singer Sargent, and then also um, wasn't, uh, couldn't <laughs> compete basically with his, his sister and his younger sister, Pauline Viado, who was 13 years younger, all right, who was going to be a diva as well. So he actually um, resorts to, I suppose you could say, resorts to um, investigation and study of the larynx and produces the first laryngoscope and writes treatises which are still used today on singing technique. Right? So it's a very, very important family. 
Now, um, Maria, when she came back after having divorced Malebran, still known as Malebran, <coughs> and um, is accepted into the um, salon uh, circuit um, through another woman who is of Spanish origin, who is of Cuban origin. This is the Countess de Melan. So, um, via this way, she um, is then going to have another opportunity to launch herself at the uh, Théâtre Italien and on the uh, French stage. Now, what is interesting at this time is that um, although she is now famous for her extraordinary lifestyle uh, and extravagant sort of acting and personality, um, the, uh, she is never accepted as a composer. Now, in, in actual fact, Maria Malibran was a composer, a great composer, not of large orchestral pieces, but um, particularly of lighter, smaller songs, many of which she published overseas. However, um, this, and this is the important point that I'm really trying to make, is that she could be accepted as a diva, uh, but not really as a serious um, composer and worker, someone who had inspiration, as one did, you know, the cult of the genius of, in, during the Romantic era, but not really someone who you took seriously and whose work you actually studied and worked with. And this is largely um, related, I'm just, this is the sort of salon atmosphere where she would have produced many of her works. Now, just before I go on with that, I just need to come to the end of her life and then we'll go back to this business about publishing. Um, she sang on all the stages of the world, um, all throughout Italy, uh, in, in, in Switzerland, uh, in England. In Milan, she was uh, performing and went out later and fell, had a very disastrous fall from a horse and refused to take any medical help. And three or four months later, was singing uh, in London, where as she was taking her third encore, she collapsed on stage. Um, refused again any medical help, got up the next morning and went to sing uh, in church and literally died on the oh. spot. Oh. So um, I've never been able to find out what she actually died from, whether it was internal hemorrhaging or whatever it was, mm -hmm. but this is a dramatic uh, death, you know, that is absolutely in sync with the, dr the romantic heroine. I mean, you know, collapsing mid-aria virtually uh, and dying uh, forever uh, unattainable, you know, the sort of princess die of the, uh, of the uh, opera, opera world. <laughs> 28, she was 28. So, um, but this means that because she has the tragic end, the biography which is written of her by her friend, the Countess de Merlin, um, makes, recounts the rest of her life as though it were leading to a dramatic end. <laughs> so, in other words, everything about what she does shows that she overexerted herself, that she, she was going to kill herself anyhow. Oh. And so, what, not suicide, but, mm. you know, that overwork. And so, they, there's a picture drawn of her um, of being this slightly flighty person um, who, for example, was just a party girl who had to go out and party every night, uh, always had to perform at the piano. Um, she would actually sing her own compositions, then she'd sing her father's compositions, and then she would launch into the entire Barbara of Seville play, singing everyone's parts. <laughs> uh, and then um, when this didn't, you know, and if she wanted to sing a, a, a Spanish a piece of work, she'd actually, and there wasn't a, a guitar, she'd thump the back of the piano to keep time while she's playing with the other hand. So this is quite possibly true, um, but what you see then is this, this idea of, of, of composition and, and, and inspirational gift as being slightly trivial and feminine and hysterical. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, not yeah, really, it's, yeah. it's, not the, it's not your Chopin, it's not your, your list who for heaven's sake we know was, would have done the same thing. Um, but also um, the, she actually composed many pieces, but she always, always composed works that were different from what she sang on stage. She um, composed voice, uh, pieces that were for one or two voices, which is very unusual for a diva. You'd think she'd be trying to hog the, the, the limelight. But the emphasis then is put on that these were feminine pieces, right? That this is, you know, she's in a feminine circuit of, of the salon, uh, and so really she was only writing for other women. Thirdly, um, uh, the Countess de Melun, who is the great authority, we don't have much else on uh, La Malébrun, said that, look, she didn't really ever sort of ask for money for her publications. It was all philanthropic. So do you, do you know what I mean? She's not someone who is out there um, to be taken note of, um, to be 
considered one of the great composers. She's a great interpreter, a diva, but on the intellectual front, uh, not as interesting. Right? Now, um, you actually have stories of uh, her, the facility with which she wrote. For example, uh, there are stories that she'd be sitting in the wings while the orchestra is tuning up or playing, and she'd be writing, composing a piece. Now, this idea of it sort of being so sort of trivial that she could just sort of toss it off. You know, this idea of hard work, incredible hard work that she must have gone through to be able to sing and perform like this um, is eradicated from her story. All right, so she is then this great fictional, tragic heroine um, of the bel canto era. Now, this is her as uh, Desdemona, again, the great sort of you know, tragic heroine. Uh, and this is her in Donizetti Zalisa d'Amore, where she actually sort of wrote part of her own part. Now, she, she was extraordinarily beautiful. Now, when she died, um, this left Garcia, Manuel Garcia, who by now had retired from the stage. They said his voice was getting a bit tired, whatever that meant, and had devoted himself to being a very hard taskmaster and um, a teacher. And so he now devotes his entire attention to his youngest child, who is Pauline Viado. Right? And it was Pauline Garcia, 13 years younger than her extraordinary sister. Now, the problem for Pauline, and very few people have heard of her either, even though she was basically the muse, inspirer, and friend of practically every great composer uh, in living in France in the 1820s, 1830s. Uh, she was not beautiful, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, I, I actually had a photo of her there. I must have accidentally eliminated it. She really was very unattractive, but she had that old je ne sais quoi because men fell at her feet uh, and constantly um, spoke, you know, devoted their lives to her, as we'll see. Well, she um, had. She was a mezzo soprano. Um, who didn't have the same range um, as her sister and didn't have the same charisma, but she benefited immensely from this, you know, creation of, of the diva uh, central stage that her sister had created and virtually stepped into her, into her boots. Now, um, I just want to show you, uh, this is uh, a lot of you have been, who are here, have been to Paris with me. Um, she lived literally with the romantic clique and by this clique I mean the great painters, writers and musicians of the romantic era who all lived basically in this, a couple of streets in the 9th arrondissement in an area which is known as the New Athens right? and she lived in, this, uh, in the New Athens quarter in the Square d'Orléans, the Square of Orléans uh, which was built uh, on, on, in an English style. Now, in this particular uh, group of houses that you have here, you had um, Georges Sand, you had um, lived with her lover Chopin, uh, you had the Viardot who lived there, um, you had Liszt who used to come to perform, uh, you had Zimmerman, Liszt of course by his uh, lover Daniel Stern, who of course was originally a countess but left her husband uh, and to follow Liszt, so all this very unconventional lifestyle. And in this painting here, we're, we're actually looking at one of the evenings that they used to have at the museum, what is now the Museum of Romantic Love. <coughs> uh, and here you have Georges Sand, um, you've got Paganini, you've got Rossini, um, I'm not sure who these other people are, but other sort of great, but, and list of course here as well, uh, well relating to Beethoven. So um, now Pauline Viardot um, was coached by her father, but was a great pianist and uh, wanted to be a pianist. She didn't want to be a, a singer at all. But her father dies and her mother then forces her to, be, to go to the stage as a singer and to abandon, well, a career as a serious pianist. 
and um, she was considered as a great pianist by none other than Liszt and Chopin. Uh, so this, you know, it wasn't just sort of the next door neighbour who says, "Oh, that sounds nice." Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it was uh, serious stuff. All right. Now she probably had a crush on Liszt, as most people did, but uh, later managed to maintain friendships. And that's what I think is really interesting about all of these diva personalities that they have these tumultuous love affairs with all these fellows, and then they're all mates, you know, and all <laughs> invited to the same soirees and swap stories. It's sort of rather fascinated me. Anyhow, so she remains friends with Liszt, um, is very close to Chopin, uh, and uh, she uh, transposes many of Chopin's works as, as songs uh, for the piano, and she also, um, some of his baccarol um, have been inspired by her influence in, in Spanish music. So they worked often together, and during the great breakup between um, sorry, Georges Saint and uh, Chopin, as you knew they were lovers for, for a number of years, um, the break came over a problem with uh, Georges Saint's daughter. Uh, Pauline Viardot constantly tries to intervene um, to soften uh, Georges Saint in relation to, to Chopin. Uh, Georges Saint was behaving in a, in a horrible way towards him, making fun of him in public and so on. Uh, and finally, eventually, is not even there when he dies. And Pauline Viardot um, actually will be at his funeral and will sing the Requiem um, from behind black curtains because, of course, women weren't um, supposed to be singing in church at the time. So she carries out her devotion to, um, to Chopin to, to great lengths. Now, she... Um, uh, this, I thought I couldn't go without showing you this letter. This is Georges Saint at her best. Um, it, this is not the days when you wrote someone an email sort of saying, hi, what is 10 o'clock Sunday a good time? This is um, Georges Saint um, asking to have an appointment with Pauline Viado, Queen of the world. You have to tell me which day is mine. I'm too jealous of the happiness I feel when I see you to require the presence of other than the elitists among your admirers answer with one word whether it will be next week or on Sunday that my poet's attic would be lit with four candles and decorated with two pots of mignonette. If I had millions I would spend them on that day to buy oriental carpets to place under your feet. As for you I will surely succeed through my unwavering adoration. I admire genius well enough, but when it is coupled with goodness, I prostrate myself before it. This was sort of 19th century prose. It, it probably just sort of meant Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, can't, you know, when you read it now and you think, my goodness, you know, what was the relationship between them? It was, it was nothing, just sort of two people who were sort of um, quite interested in the same sort of work, I think. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, uh, Pauline was courted by um, the great poet uh, Alfred de Musset. So can you see that, that you know, these, she wor works and lives in this very refined atmosphere of, of romanticism. Um, Musset, of course, hadn't been idle for quite some time. He'd, he'd been the lover of Georges Saint, had courted uh, his, the sister of Marie Brun, and now turns his attention to Pauline, who isn't particularly taken by him. And Georges Saint sort of writes him a letter, a letter and sort of saying, look, he's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and advises her. As worthy as the other uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't. I won't read that text yet. Um, but um, she advises her to marry someone much more stable and someone who will help her with her career. And so she marries Viardot, who is 21 or in fact 22 years older than her, and the director of the Théâtre Italien. So this was someone who would. Um, protect her, look after her, and uh, it, they had some kind of friendship uh, relationship. Now, um, he was a very tolerant man because he, um, the, the, the men who came and threw themselves at her feet, when you know George Song wasn't at the feet, but there, was a, there were men at the feet, um, he actually even tolerated um, uh, the great writer living with them in a kind of menage a trois. But we have um, all of these great um, writers of opera at the time, Saint-Saëns, Gounod, Massenet, Faure, you even get Meyerbeer, all write um, operas with um, Pauline Viardot in mind. Uh, in Puritani was written with, with her role in mind, Orpheus and Eurydice, uh, and Berlioz as well, although Berlioz actually cools <laughs> off uh, and decides that there's a cooling off in, in their relationship. Now she was also very close to Clara Schumann, um, uh, as 
that's not yes, that's right. Clara Schumann. They uh, kept up a, an epistolary relationship throughout their life, exchanged uh, songs and so on. So um, Pauline Viardot, while not being a diva, is at the centre then of the artistic life. Now she goes to sing in St Petersburg, uh, yeah. and there is seen by Ivan Turchinev, and he immediately falls in love with her. You know this diva on the stage, this you know romantic heroine forsakes everything, comes to Paris and writes and most of his novels from Paris and um, will live actually in the backyard of the, of the uh, Viardot's house. Now apart from these two sisters, apart from being divas, extraordinary singers, composers, they also painted as well, they were great linguists and um, Pauline Viardot was absolutely fluent in um, English, French, Italian, Spanish. Uh, mm -hmm. But also when she sang in Russian, the Russians thought that she was a native speaker of Russian. So these were extraordinary people, but it had been done by dint of incredible hard work. Um, but of course this is, you know, has been taken away uh, and you just get the uh, glamorous shell which remains. So this is Turgenev who, um, um, this is the Viardot uh, building outside at, at Bougival, um, near where we had lunch actually, a lot of us in, at the um, Fournais. Uh, and this is the Dashka or Dushka, sort of a Russian house that he literally builds in the backyard and um, comes and <laughs> helps bring up her children. Um, you know, um, the children deny there was anything more than just affection between them. Um, but these extraordinary letters that he writes to his muse and uh, really, she obviously inspired devotion, not just on the stage, but away from it. Now, as she said, the artist is the living expression of God, of nature and humanity. Now, this then is this woman, these two women from this exceptional family who managed to live outside bourgeois ideals um, in the first half of the 19th century. Well, we now um, arrive at the divine Sarah, um, who did not coin this phrase herself. This is how she was known as la divine Sarah. Uh, who manages to um, remain um, the most influential actress uh, for 50 years, uh, half a century, and creates, deliberately creates a persona for herself um, as um, an icon of the stage. She, um, if La Malibran actually had, uh, and, and her sister had become the incarnation of the romantic heroine, uh, Sarah Bernhardt is going to create herself as the femme fatale, uh, both in the way she dresses, the way she lives, uh, her choice of relationships and her choice uh, of roles. Uh, and this of course is completely in sync with the end of the 19th century with the development of Art Nouveau with these strange sinuous women um, who look rather like insects and this idea of the danger, you know, women as dangerous, uh, women who kill and in many ways um, the parts that she's going to uh, perform on stage are often uh, dangerous women. But she um, manages to subvert, she's one of these um, transgressive women um, at a time when the role of women was even more closely defined than it was in the beginning of the 19th century. Right, where now she starts out her career under the Second Empire, where you have a very, very closely formulated idea of public space and private space. Women stayed in private spaces. You know, the public space would be too exhausting for their small minds, um, for, their, for their lack of, of, of rationality, for their lack of energy, all of these things. They had to be protected by, um, by enormous skirts, you know, they had to be covered from head to foot, in fact, not unlike what's happening nowadays, unfortunately. All right, so, oh, I don't know where that got in there. Um, this is the, the divine Sarah. Now, she manages to um, bend gender as well. First of all, this is a number of things that she's going to bend. She um, plays as many <coughs> male roles as she does female roles, 
and also a bit like George Sand, um, always has this titillation of lesbian relationships. Now, I mean, if you think of Lady Gaga and, and, and Madonna, um, it's the same sort of thing, but Sarah Bernhardt did it so much better uh, and uh, with so much more class. So, but it's the same sort of thing, this a constant attempt to draw attention to oneself. So there she did that. Secondly, she, did, she subverted all the ideas of propriety. She had affairs with any man that moved. I mean, whether it was her impresario, her impresario's son, who was a leading actor. When she was 66, she had an, a three-year affair with this handsome 22-year-old leading man. I mean, you know. Um, she uh, has relationships with uh, all of the, uh, the people who paint her, she has relations with other actors, um, with all of the crown heads of Europe, I mean it was quite extraordinary and uh, has the undying devotion again of someone as we'll see later like Escoffier the great cook, so um, a woman on a great stage and she flaunts these relationships, you know, not at all what a, a bourgeois woman would be, what purity was important. She also subverts the idea of age. Um, she constantly appears to be about 20. Uh, and even when she's sort of in her 60s with a wooden leg, she's playing um, the, uh, the role of a, of a 19 year old boy. You know what I mean? She, she not, never a allows herself to fall into ageist roles. She also um, subverts religious ideas. She um, is, a, is Jewish in, in her origin and constantly says that she is, takes part in the Dreyfus affair on the side of Dreyfus, of course, but uh, plays Joan of Arc, you know, much to the horror of the conservative Catholics. Mm -hmm. uh, she also subverts fashion. She's going to make sure that she goes away from the voluptuous nature of, of women's bodies and dresses uh, and emphasises her sort of rather boyish um, silhouette, as we'll see and makes thinness um, fashionable. Uh, uh, and <coughs> she also she, uh, uh, um, portrays herself as, as, as a dangerous woman, constantly as being connected with animals, as you'll see. But even more interestingly, um, she's one of the first to actually court publicity uh, by attaching her name to products. Uh, and they're always slightly dicey products, uh, as, you'll, as, as you'll see. <laughs> All right, now um, let's have a, a look at, at, at Sarah Bernhardt. Now, she started out uh, in life as the daughter um, of a, a Jewish courtesan, and we don't know who her father is. Now, when Sarah Bernhardt wasn't performing roles, managing theatres, having a string of lovers, writing her autobiography, you know, painting, sculpting, uh, traveling the world, <laughs> she also was writing um, her own autobiography. And so um, much of the stories and legends that we have about Sarah Bernhardt are ones that she's created herself. So there's always this little hint that, you know, of course, he was a noble <coughs> and, and, you know, maybe he was the Duc de Morny himself. But what is certain is that she was sent away, her mother had no time for her, as, as you wouldn't if you were a courtesan, she had two half-sisters, and they were sent off um, into a convent and uh, to be brought up. And uh, even though uh, Sarah at an early age was expelled for insubordination, she still um, had enough respect for the nuns to want to become a nun herself. Um, but this didn't work out. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, she didn't try particularly hard. The, uh, she was actually with her mother in the salon when no other than the Duc de Morny, who was the, one of her mother's lovers, um, sort of says, well, look, this girl's got a beautiful voice. And this is the other thing, that she was supposed to have a voice like a bell, a golden voice. So these voices are, are important. Uh, and says, why don't we put her on the stage? This is the story. And uh, now you know who the Duc de Morny is. It, um, when Napoleon III comes to power, he arrives in Paris, and his mother, who is Hortense, the daughter of the Empress Josephine, has never told Napoleon III that he actually has a half has a half brother, right? And they meet for the first time when Napoleon III has come as Prince President uh, in uh, 1848. And uh, in many ways they, they bond, and in many ways uh, the Duc de Morny is going to be the brains, uh, the hard economic brains behind Napoleon III's regime. 
Unfortunately, he was a great womanizer, uh, wrote erotic ditties and plays, and died of an overdose of aphrodisiac. Um, <laughs> so he came, he came to a sticky end, shall we say. <laughs> now, um, in the meantime, he has been the, the lover of Rosine um, and uh, has launched um, Sarah onto the stage and also manages by his um, influence to get her into the Comédie Française. Now, that was extraordinarily difficult. So you do actually wonder um, if indeed uh, maybe his relationship to her wasn't more than just, you know, um, being a friend of her, her mother's. Anyway, um, she uh, is a bit of, she makes her debut as in Iphigenie, Iphigenie by Racine, uh, is not noted at all. Uh, people think she's skinny, she's scrawny, she's got a good voice, but she's sort of eccentric. And then there's this scuffle um, in the backstage when there's the audience is sitting waiting for the leading lady to appear and there's this slapping and screaming from the back and it's, <laughs> it's Sarah who's been slapping the, the leading lady because she insulted her half-sister. So she's sent off from the Comédie Française and resorts in many ways to what a girl can do um, is becoming a courtesan like her mother. And she was... Um, very talented at this, and, th and this is what you actually um, note with these courtesans, is they were very clever women on the whole, the ones that survived and, and thrived, and basically didn't like men all that much, knew how to manipulate them. Um, and this is something that Sarah has obviously learned from, from her mother, and uses um, to great power with audiences uh, and with all the impresarios and, and other actors that she has to deal with. Uh, and <coughs> during this time she has a, a liaison with the Prince de Ligne in Belgium and has a son by him, um, Maurice, who um, will be the really literally the love of her life and she, who she takes with her absolutely everywhere. He's hopeless, but anyway. Uh, his mother gives him everything, keeps him going, sets him up in theatres, picks him up when he falls down, even when he takes the opposite side in the Dreyfus Affair and is an anti-Dreyfusard. Anyway, so this is um, during this period. She then comes back and is given um, a chance again um, through the salons and then finally comes up into the stage at the uh, gymnase and plays um, a, a, a travesty role. She plays, a, appears as a young boy and gets rave reviews because of course this actually suited her figure, suited her style of acting and this is when she's actually going to, you know, be the beginning really of her career. And of course it a is as this kind of slightly sexual ambiguous, gender ambiguous uh, status that she has. And uh, she will um, carry this out throughout her career, um, one of her favourite roles being Hamlet, where she plays Hamlet. Uh, and um, another one of her roles, as we'll see later on, her greatest role will also be um, as a male character. So there's nothing that stands in Sarah Bernard's path, absolutely nothing. I think she's quite an amazing woman. Now, um, when she's not with her, then there's um, a painter at the time who was a well-known lesbian painter, Louise Abema, who ports, uh, does a portrait of, of Sarah Bernhardt and writes as a dedication that, you know, this was the beginning of our, our, our wonderful affair uh, and so on, and Sarah lets this be published and let it be known to sort of titillate her public. Now, um, she also um, creates um, a, a persona for herself by always appearing, which is what one is not supposed to do with animals, uh, and travels with a menagerie um, of uh, parrots, uh, monkeys, uh, wolves, cheetahs, um, these extraordinary dogs that look a bit like her, but also even with an alligator. Uh, and the alligator's called Ali Gaga, and, and, and she um, dies from an overdose of champagne. Uh, so, um, she wasn't particularly interested in the welfare of, of animals. Animals Australia would not be on one of the things that she'd subscribe to. They were part of her persona. This idea of this woman who's sort of in touch with the animal world, with the exotic, with the dangerous. All right, she really didn't like cats very much. Do you know what I mean? It had to be an alligator to actually make it. But here I thought this um, painting of her by Clarin, who of course is one of her lovers and then one of her great friends, um, is amazing where she manages to produce herself in this sinuous style, um, very much like the dog at her feet. 
Now, talking about animals, she also um, related herself always to this edge of, of the animal kingdom, and in particular to animals which represented death. And one of her favourite hats was a bat hat, um, which was actually a stuffed dead hat, uh, 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 bat, which uh, she would wear. So, of course, the bat being the symbol of, of death, of, of seeing in the dark, of the afterlife, and perhaps it isn't so much to us now, but in the 19th century, you know, just need to go to Pelasher's Cemetery, most mm -hmm. part, Heather, <laughs> and uh, there would be all of the bat symbols and so on, this idea of seeing in the dark, having special powers. But she, and she will maintain this aura of invincibility and, and uh, all, all the way through her life. So she not only wears the, these clothes, but also um, uh, is famous for travelling with two coffins and there is the coffin that she sleeps in uh, in her bedroom and the coffin that she receives in in her salon uh, and so this was clearly a, a kind of mise-en-scene you know a, a sort of putting of herself on the scene to, together uh, and she would receive guests in this satin lined coffin with flowers all over her with candles burning um, all of the um, apartment for example in the in the last tour we went on to Paris we went to the Rue de Fortuny near uh, Parc Monceau and uh, that's where she would have uh, lived and she had the whole place decked out in black with diamond tears and bats um, throughout the decoration all right, so um, in fact, even Victor Hugo, who was a great admirer, you know, who, who writes these letters, I fall at your feet, I, you know, shred, shed numerous tears when you represent my heroines on the stage. He actually sent her as a gift um, a, a diamond tear. All right, so there was this, uh, one knew that this was the way in which one, um, gave, you know, gave uh, adulation to uh, Sarah Bernhardt. Now, this um, is not just sort of her own imagination. She's deliberately casting herself as the romantic dead heroine, you know? Um, if you think of Millet, uh, there's a lot of Delaroche, Delacroix, um, the cult of Ophelia um, at the time where you are more beautiful in death than you are in life. Now, um, she was, she cultivated this slightly erotic, necromantic, Sort of uh, uh, theory, but she'd actually been very ill as a child, and sort of, according to her biography, it used to spit blood. But I mean, for someone who spat blood as a child and manages to sort of do, live the life she lived, and live, you know, till nearly 80, one does wonder. But um, her two sisters died; one of them died of tuberculosis, and so she was surrounded by death, uh, and in many ways, it, it could easily have affected the way she saw life. Now, she um, carried this onto the stage, and the, the heroines that she liked to depict were these, either, they were, uh, either she played male parts, all these dangerous women, or women who are dying. Here we have for Medea, of course, you know, who uh, you know, kills her own sons to, to take revenge, as well as having killed her rival, and so on. Um, but also um, people who admired her, for example, Oscar Wilde, um, wrote Salome, for her um, as a, a, an opera, at least a theatre, uh, a play for her, and wrote it in French. And here you have Aubrey Beardsley's representation of um, Sarah Bernhardt and the severed head um, of St John the Baptist. You know what I mean? It, there are lots of other parts of the scene you could have had, but it, it, it's that part that she wants to be represented with. So there's this idea of the femme fatale. Now, um, she also subverted fashion um, at the time. Now this is Sarah early on in her career. Butter wouldn't melt in the mouth as you can see. Uh, she's got a corset on and she's in the sort of rather traditional dress. Here she's accentuated this idea of her thinness and this was something that wasn't um, popular at the time. I mean we, we have the cult of, of the thin silhouette. At the time you were supposed to, to be voluptuous. You actually see photographs of women in, in their crinolines and they look horrific because they sort of just boing, boing, you know, they don't look at all the way they do in the paintings with this long elongated silhouette. Um, but also the attitude that she has and of course she's got a kind of a whip here as well. So um, this is an, a completely different um, expression uh, on her face as you can see. Now this again is uh, Clara painting her as Hugo's Rui Bla, again this um, dramatic, slender uh, silhouette uh, 
uh, emphasizing uh, these, the lines very much of Art Nouveau. Now, uh, in um, 17, oh, I think it's uh, at least 1895, I think it is, she um, has also begun directing her own uh, theatres, right? So not only does she play the main part, but she directs as well, and in fact has, has bought some of the theatres, and one of which is the Théâtre de la Renaissance. Um, and she needs posters for the publicity and uh, needs it like now and goes up to the uh, office and the only person she finds who's actually there it's on you know during the holiday season is Mucha and uh, he this is where he will begin to work for her and produce these uh, images which have become absolutely iconic here she is as Sismonda also exotic heroines Byzantine princesses extraordinary absolutely extraordinary costumes that she used to to play in and one of the, the go-to um, uh, plays that she would produce again and again and again was The, the Lady of the Camellias. This is, of course, mm -hmm. from the Traviata. Well, of course, you get this languishing heroine who dies of, you know, you know, TB, but is more beautiful in death than ever. And no one could do death scenes like Sarah Bernhardt. No, she was known that people would come from all over the world to see her die uh, on stage. <laughs> Um, and I'll, I'll actually read you a passage of, of what happened in Australia. Now, she also um, plays <coughs> roles. This is part of this idea of, of going across religions and across age. When she's in her 60s, she was playing Joan of Arc, who was supposed to be 17. Uh, the only problem was that she had to keep falling on her knees in front of the Inquisitioner, and of course this did her knees in. Uh, and so uh, she, it didn't last for very long, as opposed to the Lady of the Camellias. But um, this is, she then took on the, uh, the Théâtre du Châtelet uh, in, in Paris now, was the theatre taken over by Sarah. As she got older, um, she found that it was better to have her public at a lot greater distance from her right. to manage to be able to create this sense of eternal youth and, and, and sort of romantic sort of uh, evanescence. Uh, and so she has this, you can actually see the, the uh, little loge, what, what do you call it, do you know, the, when artists make themselves up, what's the word? Dressing room, no. Dressing room, right. So you can actually go in at half time and actually see uh, her dressing room uh, there. Now, um, she also had the, the uh, entrance of it completely done up as the Louvre dedicated to Sarah Bernhardt. All her lovers who had done portraits of her, all of these portraits were, were there uh, and so on. <laughs> now, she um, decided she became rather fed up with the Comédie Française uh, and decides to launch her own company and um, will tour for the rest of her life. She will go to America 13 times on 13 trips uh, to 50 towns to rapturous, absolutely rapturous applause. People would come hundreds of miles to see the Divine Sarah, who by the way didn't speak any English, all right? So all of, her, all of these plays were in French. So she managed to captivate people by her movements and by whatever charisma she had whether it was just this iconic uh, reputation that she developed or not. And here she is touring the United States. And actually later on, when she's very old, during the time of the uh, First World War, she tours again um, on behalf of, of France and tries to get the Americans to enter the war. So she tries to use her pull uh, in the political scene as well. Now she also tours to South America where she actually um, does a play Tosca and as you know Tosca of course has to jump out the window out off the battlements and land and often as happens to heroines landed badly and broke her knee. Uh, Gangren set in and she finally had to have her leg amputated and this didn't stop her at all. She had a prosthetic leg with, and she continued to perform for something like another 10 years with a prosthetic leg. She also had only had one kidney and um, part of one lung. So she continued to um, tour in these circumstances. Now um, what I want to look at is, is how she also associated and how she got herself across to her public. She produced, she took advantage of the latest in technology. I'm not going to have much time for poor old Louise Michelle. I might have to do her later. Um, this, this ex she, photography had now developed where you could actually get postcards 
and he, he she would um, have postcards taken of her in her extraordinary costumes that people would come to see. This is her as Theodora. Right? Um, here we have another one as, as Theodora. Again, these wonderful sort of Art Nouveau um, jewellery and, uh, and, and headdresses. Um, but also these calling cards, which now you could, you know, nowadays you get um, footballer cards. Well, there you could actually buy Sarah Bernhardt in some of her greatest poses, uh, you know, about to die or about to be, uh, about to, to uh, expire. A lot of these poses actually um, were taken from, um, I don't know if you've heard of Shaku, I think I've spoken about Shaku and his, uh, who worked at the Salpetriere with hysterical um, yeah. patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the people who used to come to watch the performance of, the, of Hysteria was Sarah Bernhardt, and she used to take Hysteria to the stage. And in fact, if you actually look at the photographs um, that were taken by Chaco of Augustine and other people, his favourite uh, hysterics, um, they're not dissimilar. They're not, no, no, they're not dissimilar from these stages of epilepsy, the way in which she actually produces you know, languishing horror and so on. And we'll see her in a moment. Now, she associates herself with advertising. I mean, you know, um, here it is, and it's got a name on it, Sarah Bernhardt um, <coughs> Rice Powder. Sarah Bernhardt Absinthe, and of course Absinthe was, you know, a drink that you shouldn't touch. It wasn't just wine. So again, a little bit on the wild side. Um, and it's obvious, even though she's not mentioned, you get this other actor saying, I drink to your success, my dear, and to those of Absinthe. And of course, we know who my dear is because of the red hair up in the bun. The, the silhouette and the fact that she always used to wear several belts to emphasise her beautiful waist. Um, she also, um, these are Sarah Bernhardt cigarettes, uh, which, uh, which I think is very interesting. Sarah Bernhardt um, is, uh, she became very interested in with Edison when she was over in America uh, and promotes, this is her at the 1900 exhibition, promoting this phono uh, cinema theatre where you could actually go um, into a particular restaurant or something and listen to the performance uh, which was being played in a theatre uh, nearby. And um, uh, Proust, for example, um, preferred to do this. So here we have Sarah again. Here she is listening to Edison. Now, when she wasn't actually um, doing all of this, you know, touring, managing her own uh, company, the, you know, uh, had her own train with her own, you know, 50 suitcases full of costumes and so on, she was painting or sculpting. And she actually had um, um, a studio up uh, on the Boulevard de Clichy, almost opposite the hotel we stay in in Paris, up on Boulevard Rochechouart. Um, on the corner up there where she painted and here, I think it's an extraordinarily modern outfit that she's got on here. Um, uh, she actually painted very well. She um, had some of her art was accepted at the salon but what she enjoyed doing most was sculpting and here would you be surprised it's a sculpture of herself. <laughs> um, but um, this is some of her work. Um, Sarah Bernard, of course the death of Ophelia, of course very much in this idea of, of death and, and the maiden and death but also um, a self-portrait, which is an inkwell, as a sphinx or as a kind of a bat. So again, sort of publicly, this image of the fascinating uh, otherworldly woman. Now she says, theatre is a public sphere suited to the <coughs> female art of externalising emotions. Theatre is female language. It allows us to express what it is to be female. We no longer just parade as love objects, but bear the feminine psyche. Oh, wow. So there you go. Now, um, in 1900, at the... Yes, well... <laughs> there is no stopping her. <laughs> the... <laughs> We've got a long way to go. <laughs> the, in 1900, of course, you have the great um, Universal Exhibition where you get millions of people um, flocking to Paris uh, to see the greatness of France, the genius of France. And, of course, who do they flock to see but Sarah Bernhardt. And she puts on, she plays the title role as the Aiglon, the Little Eagle. Um, this represents the son of Napoleon I, who died in exile. He's the Duke de Reichstadt, mm. he's the son of uh, his, his second wife. Uh, and he would have been Napoleon II, right? That's why Napoleon III, when he comes to power, takes on the, the, the number three. 
And of course, he's supposed to be a 19-year-old young man, and here you get this. Um, she, I don't think at this stage she has a wooden leg, um, but she will later play um, this role with the wooden leg. Now, um, she played this 250 times in a row uh, because people just could not get enough of it and is awarded the Legion of Honour for it. Now, what I, she also, as she got older, as seems to happen in Australia, like Bruce Stingsteen, Leonard Cohen, when they really get old, they come to Australia. <laughs> and it's the same thing with Sarah. Now, here is Sarah. Um, a, 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 pay, a photo taken of her in George Street, Sydney. And as she said, my dear, if you've ever played Sydney, Australia on a Monday night, you know <laughs> Now, <laughs> I, I just want to read um, Sarah Bernhardt in Melbourne, taken from um, the, uh, a newspaper article from a contributor to the Queenslander, so we keep it very nice. Uh, and it sort of talks about her and it says, um, finally she arrives, Mrs. Bernhardt, I, um, I had expected to see a tragic, stately woman, but the divine Sarah, though elegant, is sprightly and uh, recalls Nellie Farron, whoever Nellie Farron, Nellie Farron's vivacious manner as she stood up to acknowledge the cheers. I'm told by people who saw her in Paris that her hair has recently become a much brighter red than formerly. <laughs> Yet she wears, with advantage, colours that one would expect to look dreadful, as, for instance, a terracotta-coloured um, felt hat. Her hair is not tousled, as is the present fashion here, but is worn in a smooth knob at the middle of the back of the neck. And then she goes on to talk how she went to the Esplanade Hotel in St Kilda, uh, and there were three French maids and so on, and goes forth. And then, then they talks about how wonderful the, the Princess Theatre looked. Uh, and it says, every gorgeous peacock blush, uh, uh, plush seat in the dress circle and stalls was occupied, and the numerous mirrors reflected costly dresses and jewels. La Dame au Camellia is not a nice play. Oh. It might honestly be described as disgusting. <laughs> Madame Bernhardt looked amazingly young, not more than 20, <laughs> she's, you know, in her late nineties or sixties, in a loose white robe with dark ribbons coming from the waist and tied in front. And I'll, and then I'll, I'll spare you the rest of it. Then it goes on. All the members of her company are talented, but it was Madame Bernhardt's acting which kept the great audience enthralled. She has many mannerisms peculiarly her own, such as spreading out her hands with every finger distended and of rolling her tiny lace handkerchief into a little ball which she displays in the palm of her suspended hand. Um, Monsieur Fleury, who took the part of Armand Duval, acted worthily but was not altogether successful in the disposal of his limbs. <laughs> the display of the soles of his patent leather boots would, I think, have provoked amusement, amused comment, had not the power of Madame Bernhardt's acting overawed us all. At the close of the first act, the applause was simply thunderous. Six times the curtain rose and fell, and the tragedian, surrounded by bouquets, baskets and garlands, kissed both hands to the audience and shook her head over the helplessness of trying to express her thanks. And then it goes on, there's a, that three paragraphs of how the orchestra didn't get its act together and so someone <laughs> suggests they play the Marseillaise and then they play that, then all the English in the audience get annoyed they should be playing God Save the Queen. <laughs> and then all the Australian patriots get annoyed and so they start singing Home Sweet Home. <laughs> Like a total, total, and anyhow, anyhow, all this goes on. Yet, when the curtain rose, there fell the profoundest silence. The only blue upon the stage was Madame's dresses, which were either all white, uh, with brown sleeves and so on. Marguerite, that's the, the heroine, white and fragile, reclined upon it, um, beneath a coverlet of white silk. She looked rather thin, certainly, but her extreme attenuation is mere gossip. Her neck and arms are perfect. She acted the death scene with a start, in a startlingly original way, standing with her arms around Armand's neck and her head on his shoulder. Alarmed by her silence, he releases himself from her hold when she falls dead upon the floor. <laughs> with her clinging white draperies about her and her hair loose about her white face, she lay there as the curtain fell with the greatest, up to the greatest artistic triumph Australia has ever seen. <laughs> Even the applauding, applauding voices of men who did not understand a word of her speech were husky with emotion. <laughs> She certainly had something. Um, <laughs> that, 
Oh, je ne sais quoi. Now, <laughs> let's, um, there she is touring the front. And here is uh, Escoffier, who was totally smitten by her. We, there's not a single letter that survived, um, uh, basically, to his wife, but everything that he, every possible um, recipe that he made for the divine Sarah, who always came to stay at the Savoy when she was in London. And now, I just want to watch, this is a small piece of, look, sorry, look, I'm, uh, before I actually do this, um, being a woman of her time, she realised that the new medium for getting yourself out there and the new publicity was with films and so she begins at, uh, in her 70s to um, appear on the stage uh, and there's, unfortunately all I have is a clip of her as a, in a silent movie but um, at the end of her life she will be actually performing uh, in a movie where you actually have her voice but we'll see that in a moment. I'm actually not going to have time to speak about Louise Michel, I'm sorry. I'll have to put Louise Michel in another lecture. All right, she's worth at least half an hour on her own. I, don't, I must have spoken too much. All right, now here we have the execution of Essex. Of course it would be the execution, all right? So here we have, he's obviously very gallant about going to the block, shakes his hand or says, is that where I go? Right, the Queen visits the body and discovers the ring is missing. You know, this is, in other words, he's been executed. Obviously, the head's been placed back on. <laughs> 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 All right. You don't lay out bodies of executed people, do you? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> here we go. Now, she's, she's in her 70s by this stage, which is probably one of the reasons why she's walking like that. She has a wooden leg. Oh dear. <laughs> yes, it's not sort of just subtle. No. <laughs> <laughs> she sees the ring's gone, my God. She is. She looks tall. No, she's not. Is she's she not. No, it's that's because of the, the clothing that she's wearing. Now, in, in her very last film, um, it is appropriately called the seer. You know, the la voyante. You know, the, the soothsayer, the person who can see into the future. Um, and she was literally dying of urema, and she knew she probably only had a few weeks left to live. Um, but was determined uh, that she would continue uh, right until the end. And so when she became too ill to actually um, not just perform in the studio, but actually to perform in the living room, they brought the entire uh, camera crew and everything to film her in her bed. Uh, and she literally expires, not on camera, but a couple of hours after the, they've shot her for the last time. They haven't finished the movie, someone else stands in as Sarah Bernhardt, but always has her back um, to, the, to the audience. So um, a diva absolutely um, to the last moment, um, always caught in publicity, always creating herself um, as an extraordinary person. Now the person I was going to finish with, I've only got five minutes, so I, I, I'm not going to go into it, but I want to uh, just mention Louise Michel, who creates um, another type of legend about herself and manages to survive the commune, manages, um, even though she um, came to power, she's a school teacher, watch out for them, uh, <laughs> someone who is sort of rises very much like Olympe de Gaulle, she has the same background, her mother was a servant, her father was from, from the castle, she's given um, a good education but never quite accepted into the circles of, of her father, therefore has this sense of, of outrage um, of, and particularly of outrage of, of, of the condition of women. She um, fights on the barricades in the commune of 1871, is, is one of the central figures in developing uh, women's cooperatives, in, in working out uh, the ideals of the commune. Uh, and in that final devastating moment when the French troops come in and take over Paris, 
um, she will be one of the few survivors of the massacre of the Père Lachaise Cemetery, uh, where everyone was fired, they were I mean, hunted down, 225,000 people die in the bloody week of 1871. She um, is taken and she's not killed, um, and it's, it's uh, why? Mainly because she had such a high public profile that they didn't want to use her <coughs> as a martyr. And so instead she's sent out to New Caledonia and this was a, a traumatic experience for most of these people, these communards who weren't put to death. They were urban arts, people who lived in the tiny streets of Paris, and suddenly they're sent out to New Caledonia, um, given no housing, no clothing, no food, with a, virtually a Stone Age people to con uh, contend with. Um, most of them either died of malnutrition or exposure or um, sank into depression. Not Louise Michel. Um, she manages to reinvent herself from having been a radical feminist and a radical sort of communist um, to becoming a kind of amateur um, anthropologist. She goes around um, collecting stories from the different tribes. She writes uh, innumerable novels and plays, manages to get them sent back um, into France. And finally, um, when the Canucks actually uh, have an uprising, she gives them her red flag that she used on the barricades in 1871 as their symbol. Anyway, she's deported back to France because she's too dangerous in New Caledonia. <laughs> and she arrives to uh, 7,000 people at this railway station uh, crying, you know, vive uh, Louise Michel, they got to know about her via her writing. By the time she's come back seven years later, um, the, commune, the ideals of the commune have disappeared. You've now got the Third Republic. Uh, and, but she, however, is an anarchist, and she, will, uh, and she also is against the empire. So she then starts out again, leads a bread riot with a black flag this time, is taken and is put in prison for another two and a half years. Anyone else in San Lazar prison would succumb again either to dysentery or madness, but not Louise Michel. She writes things saying, thank God I'm in prison. I no longer have to teach and mark, and mark my students' work. I, I no longer have to worry about people on the barricades. I can devote myself to study and learning several languages. She finally comes out of prison uh, and is shot at by um, someone who wants to get rid of her, quite understandably. Uh, and however, there's a great public display of forgiving him in public, wants him to come forward. And so adds this kind of spiritual, sort of the good lady, the sort of saintly <coughs> lady to her aura. Goes to England, um, is known as the good lady there, starts up a cooperative school, has very advanced ideas on, on teaching children, for example, with <coughs> disabilities and so on. Uh, and then finally, uh, even though she's very ill, she's now become an anti-imperialist, goes over to work with the Algerians to foment uprising against, <laughs> the, against the Third Republic. And fortunately for the Third Republic, she finally succumbs and dies at, in Marseille. Now, um, I'll just quickly, I will talk about her later. Um, um, no, oh dear. I just want to get to the final. These, um, these people uh, that we've spoken about then um, were legends in their own time, but they have survived. You know, they're, they're, the personas, which was so far from that of the average women of the time, have, have lived on. Um, everyone is familiar with the face of Sarah Bernhardt through the posters of Mucha. Uh, Louise Michel, you might not have heard of her, but uh, Ségolène Royal, when, for example, she was running for president, and what she said that one of the first things she would do as a socialist president would bring the body of Louise Michel and have her placed in the pantheon. And, of course, La Malébran is now um, the person who is the incarnation of Bel Canto uh, in Paris of the 19th century. So, extraordinary women uh, who were allowed to thrive simply because they cultivated their extraordinary nature. So let's all go and do it. <laughs> <laughs>